Good evening, and welcome to this week in review. Tonight's stories include Social for the Snack Program Volunteers, Interview with Connie Boland from the School Children's Food Foundation, Public Library Ticket Draw, These Stories Plus Community Events, the BBS Playbill, Off the Rack, and more coming up after this. It takes community to heal a village. In Northern Mali, USC Canada works with local partners to find community-based ways to ensure mother-child health, food security, and jobs. Canadian agencies are helping to renew and strengthen communities throughout the developing world. This means greater opportunities for global villagers. Canadians in partnership, finding solutions that work. On Tuesday of this week, we were invited to a social gathering for the volunteers of the school's snack program. This event was organized by Communities in School worker Valerie Sims Anderson. 23 of the 30 snack program volunteers attended the event. Connie Bolin from the School Children's Food Foundation welcomed everyone and spoke to the volunteers. I don't know if you guys realize how important you are. Uh, when I give a presentation to Corn Book and Daryl in Pasadena, it's always program volunteers are here that I use as an example. And that's, that's not a lot, because you guys, your schools have the most volunteers, have the most dedicated volunteers. I know that uh, one school in Corn Book was two years uh, trying to start a breakfast program. And the reason they started is because of what you guys went through with A.G. Matthews, the lack of space. Uh, just the way things were run, but you think unique problems that this school in Cornwall also had. And because they saw AJ Matthews do it, they did it. They fed, they're feeding now 200 kids a day, and the program volunteer asked me to say to you guys, it's because of you guys. Because you guys did it, they got the nerve to try it, and it's just it's phenomenal. They started with about 60 kids uh, three months ago. They had our last numbers I saw when I was here one day last week. 210 kids go through. And it's mostly because of you guys. And that's the kind of, of the impact volunteers are having on each other. Because when I go out, I say, this is happening in Virginia, this is happening in Cornwall. And we're all kind of learning from each other. And if it wasn't for you guys, this wouldn't happen. If Valerie can't do it, you're you don't want the teachers to do it because they have enough on their shoulders as it is. We ask the parents to come in, we ask volunteers, people who are not connected to the school. And, and we found that works so well. And you guys know your communities. And it gives you a chance to get into the school, to work with the students, and that kind of thing. And particularly when you see, when you see teenagers doing it, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, most schools, it takes a long time for them to they convince the older students that it's okay to do this. A lot of the students will look at it and say, that's not cool, or we don't want to have anything to do with our friends to make fun of us. But look, once they tell them that it has to be here and in different schools, and they'll at least try it. And they all, they all, once they try it, they like the kind of thing. So you guys are our role models for schools like Regina and Herman, who weren't quite sure if the kids were, the students weren't quite sure if they could do this. So I want you guys to know that, right? And the same with the adults. I know there's two schools in Cornbrook that only have enough volunteers for a two week cycle. And this time of year, they're getting pretty burnt out. And it's and I, I think you guys have more than two weeks like that. No, we have two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Okay, so I know you guys are getting, are getting tired. Sometimes it seems like it's another day, but just, just you're so appreciated. And that's really what I want to come in and say. Thank you very much. You make my job a lot easier, and what you're doing is great. You're helping a lot of students, and things we get back from school, the feedback we get, you guys probably don't even know about. Because we're talking to parents all the time, talking to school administration, and we're just saying thanks. School board is really in favor of what you're doing, and you'll probably never hear from the school board. But we hear it. So I just want to bring it back to you guys and say thanks. Give yourself a hand. Six staff members from the school were present, including principals Doreen Benoit and Scott Lenahan. They spoke to the volunteers about how important their volunteer services were to the school, and without them, some of these programs at the school would not be possible. Of course, lunch was served. Miss Boland presented each volunteer with a certificate and a lapel pin in appreciation for their volunteer services. We congratulate the volunteers on such a successful snack program. 
On Wednesday of this week, we had an opportunity to speak with Ms. Connie Bolin about the School Children's Food Foundation. Today in our studio, we have with us Connie Bolin from the Children's Food Foundation. Is that right? School Children's Food School Foundation. School Children's Food Foundation. And she's going to be talking about our snack program. Now, you were here visiting yesterday. Mm -hmm. That was Wednesday. Um, what do you think? The programs here are, are phenomenal. Uh, the volunteer support, the community support, um, second to none. I've, uh, my area is West Coast. Uh, this is the first time I've been in Burgio to see the snack program. And the volunteers, I don't know if they realize what they're doing, and it's like what they're doing in terms of helping the kids and helping the community, but I've never seen this, I've never seen support like what's out here. And I mean that from the business people, from the residents, from your teenagers who are helping, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. Okay. I met a lot of them at a volunteer appreciation that uh, Valerie Sims Anderson had, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Just, just to see the people show up and the things they had to say and how much they enjoy it. Yeah. Excellent. Really good. Okay, so uh, give us a little bit of background on uh, School Children's Food Foundation. Now, how did that came to be? We're a province-wide organization. It's been based in St. John's since, oh, I'm not sure, I think it was 1994. Uh, my position came up last year because they finally realized we'd like to have somebody on the West Coast just to be a resource person, you know, just to put, make that bridge that gap between the West Coast and the East Coast. And they were, like I say, we're province wide, we're in Labrador, we're 127 breakfast, lunch, or snack programs, uh, 4,000 volunteers, so it's, it's pretty big. And, and what, one thing I like about going out into communities, I, like some people, you don't always realize how what a big group you're a part of. We have 4,000 volunteers and growing every day. And uh, like I say, we're into most of the schools now, uh, breakfast, lunch, or snack programs. It's okay, wonderful. so your funding comes from where? Uh, government partially, partially funds us through a grant. NAEP is a big sponsor. Dominion is a big sponsor. Petra Canada is a big sponsor. And the rest is communities. Community supports the Lions Club in all communities phenomenal supporter, a really big supporter. Uh, Avco is another big supporter. Most of the businesses and the parents themselves, the kids do fundraisers. It's the kind of thing where everybody gets involved and it is really it works well. It works really, really well. Uh, how does Burger compare to the other, uh, in, in the other snack program is run? I know in some schools they have breakfast programs. So uh, is that the norm for each school in our district to have most schools do breakfast. <coughs> um, depends on the school situation, what the school wants. What we do is we leave it to the school. You know, if you, whatever you need or whatever, you know your school. You know, like, you know, here in, in Burgess, the teachers and Valerie, they know their school. They know what works best, and we leave that to them, right? Most schools do do breakfast. Uh, there's only one other, two other schools that I'm familiar with, with snack. And I find one thing with the snack programs is you reach all the students. Whereas breakfast, you tend to, with busing and things like that, you don't, sometimes you don't get all the students. Yeah, but snack works perfectly. Okay. And I know when I go actually and <coughs> give presentations to different groups, I use as an example the schools in Burgio because of the, the great volunteer support. And what my, some people might not realize is there's a unique situation here where you're all in one school and there's no space. So to see the volunteers actually set up these trays like they do and the kids, the students come and take it, that's, that's wonderful. That only happens, as far as I know, in one other school, and that's in Cornerbrook, that there is no actual sit-down facility. And the students, it's basically done in the halls. And that's, that's, that's a lot of work. And it, it really means something when the volunteers are, are willing to do that, right? Well, it seems to work well. I've been there, <coughs> excuse me, a couple occasions when uh, it was snack, uh, snack program time, and it's, uh, it's a blink of an eye, and it's done. Yeah, it's over. It's just, it happens like that, <laughs> yeah. which is which is another good thing that a preparation takes yeah. a bit more time. Obviously, yes. getting everything out and the trays ready and such like that. But it's like, whoa, where did all those people just come from? That's right. And it's, it's a big commitment from the volunteers because they're there every day. Uh, I believe the schools have a two-week rotation, so even though your time that you're actually there is is probably not a lot, maybe forty minutes to an hour, but. The fact that you're doing it, like, is a lot into it. I know the volunteers, they like being with the kids and meeting students and that kind of thing. That's, that's really neat. Um, say, for example, now, if uh, a community didn't have a lot of uh, financial support from their community, would the uh, foundation take care of that yes. part of it? Yeah, because 
some communities um, have more service groups. Well, Cornbrook, like Cornbrook, for example, there's more businesses to drive from. There's more. There's just more people. There's more everything. And when you get into a situation where a community is smaller, you, you obviously you have to. Like we base our funding on a needs assessment of how many businesses, how many community organizations, that kind of thing. So that while we ask, we ask the, group, the program to try to be self-sustaining, but we also know it's not possible mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Just the money's not out there. Yeah. You know, and there's so many good, good organizations. There's, and there's, everybody wants to help everybody. So this way you don't feel like I've got to give my $5 to the School Children's Food Foundation. You can split it up, and we help them too with grants and sustaining funds and matching grants. Like every dollar basically that is given to the program, we match it. So... You know, it takes a little bit of pressure off the community. So they would, in in the long run, uh, if, for example, sometime during the year that uh, Valerie sent out her letters to the organization, said, well, you know, it was only four months ago that we donated. We'll wait till, but you still would subsidize yes, there. Definitely. Oh, good. Oh, we wouldn't let yeah. it go. Not, we never would let it go. Yeah. And when it's working as well as it's working here, there's no way. Yeah. It's, you, you can't, yeah. you know. You'd, okay. never, you'd never let it die out. Okay, no. is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, just to thank your volunteers, just to thank the people of Virgil. Like I said, I've never seen such community support as, as what's out here. And I was real, I, I was surprised when I went into the volunteer meeting just because everybody was so friendly and so, you know, this is the thing we do and we love it and it's, it's no big deal. And I think that uh, that's something like I want, I'd like to bring back to the other communities because some of the some communities have a hard time getting volunteers. And to be able to use a place like Burgio for an example and say, you know, this is just, it just, everybody just comes together and does it. It's a great thing. You know, we're all working together. And especially when I see the teenagers working with the adults, it's perfect. You, you can't get any better. You can't get any yeah. better. I agree. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you very much for dropping by. You're welcome. Stay tuned for more of this week in review coming up after this. Communication is the beginning of understanding, and understanding is the basis for problem solving. USC Canada believes communication should know no borders. A farmer's field in Ethiopia offers innovation for old problems in Nepal. A community seed bank in Bangladesh sparks ideas for one in Mali. All over the developing world, Canadians in global partnership finding solutions that work. Now over to Mayor Ann with the Council Report. Uh, Burjo Town Council Report for Thursday, April 5th, 2001. Uh, we didn't get our meeting on Wednesday, the first Wednesday of uh, this month, uh, due to the reason uh, the road was closed and uh, the councillor was stuck in on the other side and we didn't have a quorum, therefore we had to hold it on Thursday. Hold back on the paving sidewalks. Finally, that has come to an end. The proposal, which I believe I brought to your attention at the last meeting, was made to Penny Paving, and uh, they, have ac they have accepted our offer, and uh, they settled for 50-50% uh, uh, of the old back, so council has $17,675 to, uh, to try repair the uh, uh, shoulders and, the, and the, the separations in the sidewalks. That work will be getting underway early in the spring. Regarding the fish plant, uh, the old council, in fact, uh, four of us, we met with uh, Premier Roger Grimes in, uh, in Port of Bass. Uh, we outlined to Mr. Grimes uh, the situation in Burjo, more or less brought him up to speed again on what's happening here in our town. And uh, uh, emphasize to Premier Grimes that we feel in Outport, Newfoundland, the fishery has got to have a much higher profile than is presently being given it, and that uh, while the Ben Nevises and the White Rose and Voises Bay and so on are all good things, that uh, it's the fishery that is going to sustain the outports uh, such as Burjo. So we, we, we put that along to him, and more or less, uh, what, uh, not more or less, uh, personally, he was told uh, quite straight that he should lead that fight. And it's, re it's not only a responsibility of the Minister of Fisheries, it is the responsibility of the Premier to take the bull by the horns and uh, start doing something about giving the fishery a much higher profile 
and putting it where it should be. Uh, as a result of a meeting uh, we held earlier in January with uh, MP Bill Matthews and, uh, and uh, Calvin Parsons and so on in which we came forward with some new initiatives to try uh, get a resource for the Burjo plant. Uh, it was requested at that time that uh, Mr. Matthews would try set up a, a meeting in Ottawa for us and I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, uh, Councillor Reed and myself will be attending a meeting at uh, 1130 on Monday April 30th in Ottawa to once again uh, have a kick at the can to see if we can get some resource for Burjo. Uh, Mr. Hone Marsden from the executive of the Union here in Virgil will also be accompanying us on that trip and uh, they have got a proposal as well which will be uh, put to Mr. Dallywall. Uh, Councillor uh, Billard uh, brought council up to speed on a reply which they had from Mr. Barry and uh, the reply from Mr. Barry was not uh, very optimistic to say the least. Uh, Councillor Billard advised that they are still working away and uh, and uh, had a proposal, uh, getting a proposal put together at this time. Regarding the town's water, uh, Atlantic Engineering have been in town. They've uh, taken water samples. Those samples, uh, I think it was something like 15 gallons of water. Uh, 15, no, 15 gallons I, I believe went to British Columbia for uh, sampling and 10 gallons went to uh, Quebec. Uh, they have took flow readings were taken for a 24 hour period. Every 15 minutes they took a reading on our flow rates. Uh, there's more monitoring to be done, but uh, I must say that uh, Council is very optimistic that a start to improving the water in Virgil will be made during this year, the year 2001. And uh, hopefully before the end of 2002 that uh, your water in Virgil will be very much improved and uh, at least a start is made and uh, hopefully it will be carried right to the end. Uh, there were applications. <laughs> Seems like the spillover is in the air as far as uh, materials that came from the old school that was uh, was removed because council had applications for, uh, for seven sheds uh, to be constructed. The sheds met with the building codes of uh, Code of Burjo and, uh, and uh, was, uh, and was uh, approved by uh, council. Council received a letter from the District Advisory Council of the Calder Health Care Center and uh, this letter was asking council for a letter of support regarding the acquisition of a bus. Uh, from what we could gather from it, it's a bus that would uh, transport people from the neighboring areas of Grand Brit, uh, Ramia, Gray River, and Francois uh, to Corner Brook uh, free and uh, to speed up and get everybody on a, a same day uh, appointment and so on and so forth with the doctors. Uh, Council really considered this and gave it some lengthy discussion. However, at the end of the day, we felt that, uh, you know, you're talking about quite a cost. You're, you, they weren't asking council for money, but apparently, you know, it's a bus that would cost about $70,000 in insurance and so on. Everything had to be considered. But that be, not being a concern of councils, really, we felt the, that uh, to have a bus that would be taking people in and out uh, free of charge uh, would be uh, uh, conflicting with the private enterprise in this town. Uh, we don't have all that many businesses there. I'm pretty sure most of our businesses are struggling to survive. So therefore, uh, with that, the uh, council felt that they could not support this, uh, this uh, endeavor by the advisory council and uh, therefore we did not give a letter of uh, support. Snow clearing, just to bring you up to date on that, that uh, council budgeted about $25,000 uh, for snow clearing this year. Uh, we have spent $18,000, so we've got $7,000 for, hopefully for uh, the fall. But uh, just looking at that, you know, you can see uh, with the amount of snow that we had as compared to St. John's, 
that uh, if we had got hit with the snow the way that St. John's did, uh, then uh, Berger would no doubt be looking at a deficit in its uh, snow clearing budget. The last item, I guess, for discussion, and, and it seems to be an ongoing thing, is the dogs, 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 what are we going to do with dogs? It is quite obvious, I'm sure, to most of you out there that there's some people who just now, in particular, there's two or three black lab or door retriever dogs, which I don't know who owns them. Might have a fair idea because some people who used to have dogs in their dogs' houses don't have them there anymore. But everybody has seen them going around, and uh, so what's the council going to do about it? Uh, we're not prepared to just let it carry on. So therefore, the uh, town manager has been asked to get out the dog regulations and we're going to have another look at it and do some more thinking on it and I can say right now that uh, uh, one of the things that we're sort of looking at is that uh, it could be on a bounty system or we could have a dog catcher and any dog that is picked up it would cost two hundred dollars to get that dog back and even if the dog didn't go back if the owner of the dog is ascertained then the owner will be charged two hundred dollars even if council had to destroy the dog for the pickup fee. You know, these are, these are, these are a pretty strict, uh, uh, hard way to go, but uh, you know, people cannot in this town have to put up with, the, with uh, roaming animals uh, by a few people. So, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be too bad if that kind of thing has got to come into effect because some person who is unlucky enough that their dog do get off is probably going to get zapped with, a, with quite a hefty a fine in order to get the dog, or a hefty fine whether you get the dog or not. Uh, and this is all because some people have uh, took it on themselves to disobey the dog regulations and let their dogs run anyway. So you can look for an upcoming in at a later date concerning this. Uh, that was it for our council. However, even though I didn't want to do this, I feel that I have publicly got to respond to some allegations that was made by the, uh, the economic development officer, Mr. Ellier, on last Sunday night's uh, news, and that is regarding the arena. And I would like to, there's two items that I take issue with, and uh, I would like to point out that, and I'm sure the people of this town know quite well, that the original decision to build an arena was not made by this council. This council have struggled with that, that de decision. Mr. Ilyer referred to councils flip-flopping on the issue. I'm sure uh, you can appreciate after seeing Mr. Hillier how delicate, touchy, and unpopular it, 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 it has been to not support the arena. Council, because it has decided to hold a plebiscite and let you, the people, have a democratic vote as to your feelings regarding the arena uh, has been likened uh, to, the, to the Quebec separatist. Now, you know, that's not very uh, fair as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's no one on council that wouldn't like to see an arena, but we're just dealing with the facts that has been presented to us. And the item two I take exception to is the inference that council needed to be reminded that the funds in the account is not council's, but was raised for rec purposes and not to be put into general revenue. I can assure the people of Virgil that council has no intentions of using those funds for any reason any reason other than what they were raised for. Council do not have those funds in their account. Council is not accountable for those funds. They have never been in council's account. I don't know who's got the rec commission account, but I can guarantee you, I know who don't have the, the account. The only involvement council has had, and as you see, is the thermometer which is in front of the council building, which gives the amount that should be in that fund. I also take note that supposedly given all the interest that there is in Aki in this town, and supposedly the fundraising which is going on, 
that that thermometer haven't moved for four years. I'm very proud to be quite honest with you to say that this council do not have to rely on telethons or bingo to carry on our everyday uh, business. And I must say, I did find that a statement to infer that council would even consider this was an insult to the integrity and the intelligence of your council. The plebiscite has been, is well underway. You know it is on the 24th. And the question which will be asked, which we, 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 we sought legal advice in, and the question that you will have to answer is this. And this, we wanted to put this so that it would be clear, there would be no double meaning, there would be nothing. The decision that you will be made to make, will be asked to make, the question is this, should the town council of the town of Virgil construct an arena in the town? Yes or no? Thank you and good evening. On Thursday of this week, the public library held their ticket draw. Mr. Jim Pink, on behalf of the library board, would like to do a presentation and have a draw on bid in a bag.
Stay tuned for Off the Rack, the community events, and the BBS Playbill, all after this. In West Africa, when rain is scarce, crops fail, forcing rural people to move to cities in search of a means to provide for their families. With the help of USC Canada, villagers in northern Mali are fighting the pressure to leave with projects focused on market gardens, small credit schemes, and improved soil conservation methods. Help the people of Mali fight back against desertification and drought. Support USC Canada today. Off the rack. This week as we scanned our tape rack, we came across some tape of a 26-foot birch bark canoe that visited Burgio. Let's look back to July 1998. Can you tell us exactly uh, what materials were used in the construction of the canoe? Um, of course, uh, we don't have big enough trees, or at least we can't find birch trees big enough in Newfoundland any longer to be able to build a canoe of that, of that size, and the, or the strength of the, the bark. So that bark uh, in the canoe comes from uh, Ontario and Quebec, and the cedar comes from Quebec. Uh, the other wood in it, of course, in Newfoundland was spruce and juniper and hardwood, and the roots that's in it, it's an all Newfoundland material. Uh, spruce gum, beer fed all are all Newfoundland material. The canoe is 26 feet long and it's approximately two to 40, 42 inches wide. And its carrying capacity is, we haven't really tested it, but we know it, it, it's comfortable with 2,000 pounds and it can probably go to four or five, I'm not sure. Good evening and welcome to the community event segment of tonight's broadcast. I'm Jennifer Rex. The Health Committee will be hosting TV Bingo on Wednesday, April 18th at 7 p.m. Cards are a dollar each or six for five dollars and are available from any Health Committee member and are in most stores around town. Please support the Health Committee and play TV Bingo and you can be the next winner of three hundred dollars. The Lodge are selling tickets on a basket of towels. All proceeds will help offset costs of repairs for the lodge. Tickets cost a dollar each or three for two dollars and are available from any member of the lodge. The Burgio Lions Club are selling tickets on a hundred ounces of cheer. Tickets are a dollar each or three for two dollars. The bottle will be in various stores around town. All proceeds will go to the Max Sims Camp. The draw date is Tuesday, April 17th at the Lions Club Bingo. If you haven't purchased a ticket but would like to have one, please contact Max Billard at 886-2442. The Outreach Employment staff will be providing demonstrations on how to use the job kiosk in the Outreach Office lobby on Thursday, April 19th from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Drop by to see the demonstration. It can make all the difference for your job search. If your group or organization has an upcoming event plan, we will be happy to advertise it for you. Just call the BBS office by Wednesdays of each week to have items included in this portion of our broadcast. That concludes the community event segment of tonight's broadcast. See you next week. BBS Playbill. Tune in on Tuesday for a rebroadcast of Pansy's Garden. 
Try your luck on Wednesday by playing Elk Committee TV Bingo. Tune in on Thursday when we'll have a rebroadcast of the bandwagon. Join Pans and the Gang for two stories, a craft, and lots of fun on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on Pansy's Garden. And I'll be here again next week with This Week in Review. Please stay tuned now for the bandwagon. For This Week in Review, I'm Marie Rose. Good night and God bless.